Greetings everybody and welcome to Consciousness Rising Zimbabwe and Beyond. My name is Tanya Norris, I will be your host today and on this channel we like to bring you people that are doing great things in their community and making a difference. Also people who are interested in alternative or holistic type of ideas and lifestyles. So today I have got a real true Zimbabwean treasure here today. Uh, he is a cultural influencer, a thought leader, a motivational speaker, author, musician, a uh, fashion designer now. And he is also the founder of uh, Farmers of Thought and AIM, which is African Indigenous Movement. So it is my great honor and privilege to introduce you to the all-inspiring Joshua Maponga. Welcome, Joshua, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, and greetings to you and all your listeners around the world. And it's a privilege to be invited on your platform. I thank you. So, Joshua, uh, I want to just first of all say to our listeners that uh, there's extensive information. Uh, if you want to listen to any of uh, Joshua's philosophies, many, many other interviews that can fill in the gaps if we have gaps here today. Uh, Joshua, we could talk about politics, we can talk about Pan-Africanism, African history, and all those things. I think for the purpose of this channel today, if we could just talk about spirituality and maybe your journey into uh, your indigenous belief systems and, and things. You were a pastor for 33 years. I want to know what was going on on the inside that led to the transition. I've heard you talk about it, this, but I've never heard you tell us what was going on on the inside. I'm, I'm born from a family of uh, pastors, from my grandfathers to my fathers. I've studied and proliferated in the Christian education system for the longest of time. That's all I know uh, from you know tertiary to graduate work. And I've worked in the same church space for the longest of time. And I think my the what broke the camel's back was the the insensitivity of the religious community, particularly the church in terms of responding to social social issues. That was number mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And it was the pain of seeking for this spirituality within a Christian space, which is then punctuated by dogma, by theology, and uh, lots of do this, do that, do this, do that. And before you notice it, it just becomes mundane and routine, you know, going to church, doing the same thing over and over again, singing the same. And, you know, as a, as a, as a spiritual person, I think it's building you. you. You are looking for something much more. Mm -hmm. It's not just about you focusing on Jesus, <clears throat> giving your offerings, clapping the hands here and there, going for camps. And it kind of, I think, um, to, to, for failure of a better word, I kind of outgrew that uh, smoke screen of this is this is God. And I remember as a young boy at one time when they said, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. And then we all stood up and we went forward and the pastor prays for us, prayed for us. And after the service, I remember with my friends, we sneaked into the church and we were looking under the pool because we were looking for this, for this Jesus. They were telling us that he's here. <laughs> and, and we found that there's nothing underneath the pulpit except old Bibles and a few hymn books. That, that they'd been left there for a couple of months and you begin to become disillusional and uh, worse, uh, having gone through the liberation struggle and uh, other issues, it really then threw me right off the bus mm. because the same system and structures that I'd come to trust and believe in as the source and means of my salvation then became the worst part of the, creating in me again, what I might call the enmity to some mm -hmm. certain level yeah. And I think as a young person, I became disillusioned totally because what I'd been told was true and what I was told was right. And what I was told, we're going to go to heaven together. We're going to live happily ever after. And I look around the people who I'm supposed to go to heaven with, and it looks like we won't even make it for lunch or supper together. 
I, 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 as I grew up, I discovered that this whole culture and uh, you know indoctrinating people to manage their social and societal, spiritual function. And once spirituality and consciences have been taken away from the people into the hands of other people, then you, you find that you, you have lost your consciousness and your soul. Someone mm -hmm. else must tell you when someone else has access to God, which you don't have. Someone else will put you on a timetable and then they load you up with guilt. If you don't do this, if you don't do this, person, I just got tired. It's like, I just got tired of the lies, the, the window dressing, the, the, the marketing side, let me say, the marketing side. And, and I was looking, as I'm still looking for something more honest, more full, mm -hmm. more meaningful. Uh, and I think that's a path. I cannot say I've arrived, but I'm surely walking and I'm walking very fast. To say the least, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, you certainly are. Yeah. And the thing is, so where did you actually go? Because you have a lot of knowledge about uh, traditional medicines and herbs and um, and that whole cultural side. Who taught you that? Did you just learn that yourself or where did that come it's, from? Um, it's, it, it's, it's sacred knowledge, which is embedded in all our DNA. It, we all know these things and they are enhanced when we are brought up in environments and in communities, which then remind you of what this is and what this is. I mean, your, our grandfathers and grandmothers have all been eating these herbs for the longest of time. They are in the bush, but they're also in us. If you could use that as a form of immunization. So the rivers know me because I, my grandfathers were drinking here. The bush knows me because that's where the waters to bath me when I was born came from. And so you, we are intertwined mm -hmm. with our with our nature. Mm -hmm. But when you live with your grandparents, and I was born in the late 60s and early 70s, when I started heading cattle, we walked in the bushes, then you are told this is not even in the sense of initiation, which has become quite a, a taboo because then people are doing all sorts of weird things trying to get this information. It is natural information. It's not even traditional medicines. It's what I might want to call natural medicines. And, and the beautiful part about it is when, you, you're, when your knowledge of language is, is enhanced, then you can use that knowledge to walk nature. Then you can even hear the words that are used for trees, for shrubs, for roots, rocks, and etc. They're actually linked the, 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 with the human body parts. Mm -hmm. So you would find um, what chases away the clouds, mususu, susu, sisu, meaning for the stomach, and 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 then the, the thing goes on. So that the, the, the knowledge itself is not hidden in some sacred place somewhere, but is actually kept in, in language. So when you when you remove the indigenous language from the people, and you replace it with English, then you come up with Jatrophas Caracas, you come up with eucalyptus trees, and children memorize these, these, what they call them, biological or whatever names of these trees. And they can no longer relate to Tondo, Musasa, Mutoge, and Gawakawa. Then, then they lose, they lose the entire language as it were. But to say the least, if you can look at my, at my head, this is, this is my library into into the forest because mm -hmm. the forest is painted in these colors and the body human body is painted in these colors light is in these colors uh, healing is in these colors medicine is in these colors so the greens are for the gut and the stomach the yellow are for the other human parts the red the thing mm -hmm. that cleanses the blood itself, and then the purples for the mind and consciousness, and etc. So you can actually use this hat as a model of diet, where you can say you are going to eat green, you are going to eat yellow, you are going to eat purple, you are going to eat red, you are going, to... and as it were, nature is as natural as that. It's not more complicated than that. People want to have some aha, spiritual, you know, mm -hmm. ecstasy, and etc. But in my world. It is as simple as that nature is colorful, color is color, 
and the human body is colorful and it all responds to what you are to what mm -hmm. is outside there and when you marry those two i think well-being begins right there i'm glad that that you brought that up about your hat because it is some, one of the, the interviews that I saw you on, you were talking about that. When I say that you are now a fashion designer, that's not a joke. You actually started a whole um, fashion and accessory line, but it isn't just about the clothing. It's about taking all of those aspects and, and woven it together with the cosmology and, and what you call codes for life. So it's not just a garment. It's so much it's a more library. than government. In fact, it, it, it is a library. The, what, what, what our modern formal education has, has managed to mess us up with, it is to undermine indigenous knowledge systems. So our forefathers, as it were, they did, they did crafts. They did pieces of art. And these pieces of art are actually uh, cords of knowledge and information, mm -hmm. which... You may just think, oh, Joshua is putting on a couch, a traditional hat, as it were. He's putting on a cultural hat. Oh, that's lovely. That's lovely. <laughs> and someone may just go, oh, can I buy it? How much is it? It's, it's not if you, you don't, you're missing the whole point. It's not even mm -hmm. about how much is it. Mm -hmm. It's not just a fashion statement. Yes, they look beautiful in terms of fashion. But if you get closer to this, you may find that beads have uh, had, had a multitude of ways. It was a library. Before we could buy them from China and the Phoenicians in the late... 15, 16, 1800s. We used to make these beads out of bones and out of uh, natural seeds. And, and still the same thing. When girls are going on their periods, then they would give them the red bead to start their period two, three, four, five. On the seventh day, when she starts thinning, they put the orange ones. Then when it finally stops, they put the white ones. Then she, if she, there's no pregnancy during that time. Then when she starts ovulating again, they put on the green and then etc. So then when you when you are coming from church and you see a woman with beads, you say, oh, that's a witch. That's 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 witchcraft. But if you get closer, you may actually find that this is contrast. Yes. This is an intensive knowledge system of a woman being in control of her body, knowing her cycles. And exactly because there were no contraceptions, she knew when to sleep with her husband. And when not to sleep with their husband, when to bear children, and when not to bear children. And I bet you these women are were far much more educated in charge and in control of their bodies than the more modernized women. And when you see this half moon shaped, uh, you know, stick that I'm carrying here, mm -hmm. uh, when in Aranga tribes down here, when a child is born, she's, he, she, particular ladies, she's kept indoors. For about three months, you know, on the on the third month, when the moon finally uh, sits in the moon, then the parents will then take the child, and then they show the child to their mother, and the mother is the moon, because mm -hmm. the cycles of women anatomy are not on the Gregorian calendar, but they are managed by the movement of the moon. So the, the, the girl child is actually brought into sync of timing mm -hmm. so that from that first day that she sees the moon, the following day, then she's outside of the house and she starts growing like another child. But the mm -hmm. first day that she's outside is the cosmology of the moon. As it were to say, mommy, I am here. Going forward, I'm going to be seeing when you sit and when you go down, when you are a full moon, and my moods and my temperaments, my fertility will be driven by the moon. Again, people find Africans holding their children, showing them the moon. And they say, oh, look at these barbarians. They are worshipping the moon. No, come on, sit down and ask. We're not worshipping the moon. We understand the solar calendar and how the movement of the moon <clears throat> out there is in sync with the cosmology in the womb of the woman. And, and for me, this is... This is natural knowledge. Our grandmothers yeah. would sit us on fire and show us these, these, these things. And they became part of us, you know. And then you go to school and you're told everything that you were told is wrong. Only to grow up again now and discover everything that you were told is wrong, is right. And what you thought was right is wrong. It is just chaos. Maybe let me call it Babylon. That's why I get confused. <laughs> No, you're not confused. You're absolutely right there. 
you know, it's funny you you talk about that uh, that moon, and you go all the way back to Moses, Moses's time. Apparently, he was uh, the religion at the time was a moon. They they worship the moon in ancient Egypt, and that was really where he came from. And this is why often you'll see Moses with like a half moon on his head, and he's depicted like that. You know that whole Jewish religion. The name of the religion I think was Sin was S I N was the, the name of the moon. And uh, that's just where you get like synagogue and things like that from. So I'm sure you are aware of all that history. Very yeah. true. Is Islam, if Islam also, they still have the, the moon as their symbol. And uh, in Egyptian, Hermetic uh, religion and uh, spirituality, then you have the sun, which is the father. Then you have the moon, which is the mother. Then you have the star, which is the child. So the Trinity, of uh, if you to use a more um, religious word mm -hmm. of nature, mother, of fa father, mother, and child, or rather mm -hmm. it's mother, mother, and child, mm -hmm. because it is the mother who is able to download spiritual data, uh, you know, into physical form. So women in Shona culture, we call them Musika Na, Musika Na, and the word name for God is Musika Vano, mm -hmm. Musika. Then that small little piece of tool we use when you are cooking our sadza in, in yeah. the thing, the one that you like that. So yeah. the name of the male child is equivalent to the name of God in Shona culture mm -hmm. because they all create, they all cause to being, they all translate spiritual substance into physical form. So women are the door, the official door through which we come into existence. And therefore, there's no bigger God than the one who has brought you into being. Mm -hmm. And uh, where the whole patriarchy thing is taught by the Bible. It's not African because yeah. it is the Christian teach that there's God the Father who is a man. It's God the Son who is a man. It's God the Holy Spirit who is a man. So are you telling me that heaven is a gay republic where <laughs> a group of men sit by themselves to reproduce each other? Then, then, then what's I, that's when I begin to understand the Jew, the, the, the Greek, the what called the, 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 the Kemetic Ankh, which then yeah. is clear to say it is the womb. And then you put a line, and then you put a thing, then the, 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 the plus sign. So it is the womb that is the door into the physical realm. So for mm -hmm. me, actually our knowledge systems and our ancient spirituality has the fullness of the balance of nature in its, in its truthfulness. And to understand that, it would dispel all forms of dogma and theories that reduce people to animals, evolutions, atheism, and all these other new models. Now even have the new one, we were there. They are no longer a he. You are no longer a she. We, we I call you they. Mm -hmm. Come, someone, someone, take me out of here <laughs> before I lose my mind. I watched a very interesting interview you did with the L is LGBTQ add-on, add-on, X, Y, Z uh, uh, interview. That's a, and I, I, I'll, I think people should go and watch that interview. You might learn a thing or two there. Uh, Joshua, what I wanted to ask you about is your, you have a blog, okay, Farmers of Thought. And that is audio. I've listened to a lot of those. I think you also have it written down somewhere. What I wanted to ask you, where does that inspiration and that philosophy come from? Do you consider yourself a channel? That's a, that's 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 deep, but I, I I will share I will share with you. Um, I I get woken up every morning at about three in the morning. I I I, I come alive mm -hmm. between three and sometimes five, sometimes six, sometimes seven, depending how intense the 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 moments are. Yeah. Uh, clear off my brain, uh, clear off my mind. And uh, this has been happening, I think, for the past five years or six years. Mm -hmm. Earlier on, I thought it was coincidence. Then I'll wake up and just read and do something. Then I sleep again. And I, but sooner or later, I discovered I was wasting time. Then I started getting this. Um, I had some few few dreams, quite some paranormal dreams, what I might call you know, extraterrestrial kind of dreams where you are in spaces which are beyond, I was at, I dreamt I was at a party or I dreamt I was in a bus, you literally in a cosmic space where 
you're interacting with energy bodies beyond human comprehension. And as it were, even my music career, just to share one dream with you, I, or vision, I don't know what to call it. Um, I don't have words, I just was there. Late in the night, I sleep like everyone else sleeps. And um, and I'm, in, I'm standing on a cloud, a big, huge cloud, huge expanse, it's nothing, nothing. It's just blue and white clouds, but very soft clouds sort of thing, you know? And while I'm standing there, a huge, uh, like a temple appears, but I can't see the roof. I'm only seeing the pillars, beautiful white pillars, like the Roman pillars, mm -hmm. shooting into the eternity of, 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 of the sky, which I can't look beyond that. And then I see a staircase of beautiful, marble blue shiny stones like a gentle steps that are leading me that way mm -hmm. and while i'm admiring the architecture then i see this this group of old ancient men they are not white they are not black they are like ash literally but ash gray kind of thing so mm -hmm. I, I would almost ash yeah ash gray but towards the darker and et cetera. And they're there and they start singing and then they start chatting. This is beautiful, you know, because I'm musically minded. The, the melodies were so complex, but yet so peaceful and harmonious. I woke up in the morning actually singing and like I joined in the song mm -hmm. and I ran into my studio, but now I have a studio in the house and I started recording. I've not been able to capture that, so that sound and I've done more than 600 songs later, and I'm still trying to, to capture <laughs> what I had there. So it's, it's these kind of things. And when I wake up, then you write, you meditate, you think. Sometimes I have a word, just one word that is dropped into my spirit, you know, mm -hmm. Ubuntu or Karanga or Bika or this, then my mind just is, is energized to think Things that under normal circumstance I could I could not have comprehended that, but I think I've been, been able to put my mind at rest and, mm -hmm. and and quiet, calm my my mind to a level where I could begin to to hear the, the thought processing pattern. And sometimes it's scary. You will have a, a statement and a word, and you are told one. Then you write one. You are told two. Then it's a under two. B under two, C under, and then Roman numeral one under C, Roman numeral two, Roman, and then three, then one. And sometimes it's so meticulous that I literally don't have to do anything but just 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 type. It's like I tap into this reservoir of information that I, I, I don't know what to say, mm -hmm. but it is there. And I've discovered there's nothing new that I'm writing. It is everything that we all know, but maybe it's just awakening of myself. So it's my own personal journey, those that are following, those that are listening. And in my writings, there's both frustration, chaos, my anger, I'm dealing with lots of my issues also in my writing, but I've not hidden that mm. or tried to be a hypocrite and just work mm. on it in my private. Mm. I've just allowed my path mm. to become open. As I learn, I grow, I think. And, and you're bringing everybody with you on that journey because you're exposing them. This is what's going on with me. And then we all move forward together like that. Yeah. Oh. Except, for a few of my, if, except for a few of my far left Christian brothers yeah. who actually feel, no, 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 no. You must come back here. You must come back here. You, it's almost like forcing me at uh, 54 years later to put on a diaper, you know, and they uh, said, no, man, guys, I can, I can handle myself. You don't need to babysit me anymore. I'm grown up. But maybe it is from within that institution that you can make change. Maybe, maybe sometimes you can't do it from the outside. You've got to be in there to create the change. So maybe they're onto something. Yeah, they're onto something. But uh, And honestly, I believe in Psalm 23, which says my cup runneth over, simply meaning that what is in the cup belongs to me. You can only enjoy what is flowing out of my cup. So until my cup is full, there's no goodness that you can follow that is falling out of my cup. So maybe I become a bit selfish yeah. in that I, I would need to have a certain amount of understanding me first before I pollute everyone else and, and uh, get myself mm. confused. Yeah.
But I, I've heard you talking about how you are writing your own book, which is like the book of Joshua, <laughs> which is like a, it's an add-on like that, like, the, uh, you know, the book of Judas and the book of uh, Mark, Matthew. You know, we're now going to have the book of Joshua. Um, and I don't know when we can expect that to be out, because I think that's certainly going to be an add-on to any scripture. Whatever religion you choose to follow, it's going to be the add-on, I think. It's what makes it what makes the work so so personal and passionate to me is um, for a, for the educated and scholar side of me that has read a thousand plus books to learn. There's been a dis this uh, this favor where oral knowledge has not been downloaded and shared in mainstream academia. So that mm -hmm. while we are arguing academics, we could also have a reference point of our oral tradition. So part of the writing, very in, intrinsic part of the writing is the, the, the collection of what I heard my grandmother say, what I heard my grandfather say, and what the, my, 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 old, my connection with the ancient world. Their, their taboos, their fears, their anger, their, and, and all that, and being able to harvest that and put that in a book. I, and I think it will be a beautiful bridge for mm -hmm. all those who are recovering addicts from the <laughs> intuition of uh, what I might want to term, you know, <laughs> an external type of education. So it's yeah. like a rehabilitation for myself first, but for the rest of the world. But we've done 233 chapters now. And I think on 250, uh, if the spirit allows me, I will publish the first episode, which is uh, the first. But it's a book I will do for the rest of my life. The complete works will be found at my grave, mm -hmm. where then people can get all of it mm -hmm. and now have a set of my life story. In, in my, I'm writing my own story, my way, day by day. And I think where after I'm gone, other children can come here and 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 find out where was I, who was I, what did I do, what did I understand, and and walk their own path also. Mm, that's right. Uh, I find I do find that uh, the world is very brainwashed. Okay, first of all. However, I do think Africa with its everyone's a Christian, you know, and that's uh, I don't know how you get through that. How you get through that. Um, but this is why we rely on people like you to try and change the thinking process in people. Mm. You know, and so it's, it's being able to access maybe not even the older people, but the young people uh, mm. to let them know that there is a different narrative. There is a different way to be in the world outside of that, uh, that religion. Not, not to say against Christianity, really not at all. But there's a different way to be. Yeah, but the, the educational institution has taught the young children to memorize. You know, how many legs does a grasshopper have? Memorize when did Bismarck win the war? You know, what year did this happen? What year did this? You know, memorize William Shakespeare, a bit of Charles Dickens there, mm. Julius Caesar, and then you put all these things in your brain. And then at the end of the day, you think that you, you are educated. No, hell no. You are just, you have not been taught how to think. You have not been taught how to question. You've not been taught how to find meaning and purpose. And to be, have a certificate in your hand simply means that you are good at memorizing certain things and very time, many times and often. The nature has proved us wrong. The most educated amongst us are the poorest. Not that they're really poor, but their education is not equivalent to, mm -hmm. their, to their, their wealth. Mm -hmm. And yet those who fell along the roadside do not learn how to read and, and our biggest entrepreneurs who don't know no rules and they've risked everything and they have employed the educated <laughs> to, mm. to do then you you begin to see also that the, the, the weakest link on the development of the African child could be lack of cognitive tools I might call them cognitive tools or critical thinking tools because even when you take these educated people and you put them in government you put them in parliament you put them in, in, in academic institutions. They don't go there to transform, to reform, 
to, to engineer, to innovate, to create. Rather, they go there to become proliferated as Professor so and so, Professor so and so, and continue the same tradition of brainwashing. So, universities have become a photocopying machine of fools. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But you, you talk about that all in the context of Africa. I see it in the context of the planet. I see a whole planet of that happening, to be honest. The classroom is one of the worst places. The classroom and the church, for me, are the worst because yeah. they've not changed their face for the, in the last 400 years. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the more, the, more old, the older it is and the less you change, we tend to think that it's the better. So which the best university? Cambridge. How old is it? 150, 108 years old. Next one, it is Oxford. How old is it? And we actually think that there is a, there is a, there is, there is some sublime innovation from antiquity. <laughs> and only to, to discover the historical side of the institutions are fine. Yeah. But in, in, when they become too traditional, they lose touch with modernity. I mean, our telephone companies here, the, the one of the British telephone telecom com companies, Telcom, Escom, PTC, they're out of business. Yet they're the biggest suppliers of network. Now modern technology come, and those have remained as white elephants. So it's mm -hmm. not survival of the best. Rather, it is survival of those that can adapt while mm -hmm. the technology is, is transforming. Religion is and education are actually going backwards, and 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 I think that any educated man or a woman who graduated in the sixties, in the seventies, and in the eighties must be fired from work, even in the nineties, because the books that you read were written in the twenties, the technologies that were in the eighteen hundreds, and 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 if I give you a cell phone that was that was being used in 1990 today, you may end up carrying a whole brick on your ear. And if technology is moving with that pace and education at that space, there's no way you can graduate in the 1990s and think that you can adapt to the 2000s and beyond. So we educate or we fossilize. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you know that there's a big trend in the world and I'm sure you've heard it, you know, this great awakening, people are waking up, yada, yada, all of that stuff. Do you think that that is happening? That people are waking on up? The African people... continent, on the African continent where I've spent most of my my life, less my few years in, in Europe and in the US, uh, there is a great a grand raising. If, if you look around the uh, countries uh, that I'm working, if I look around the social and media spaces that I'm constantly found in, you begin to see a desire to, to learn, to grow. And the biggest of them all, it is the cry for identity, where the African child for the first time, and I speak purely for the African child in mm -hmm. its plurality across diaspora, transatlantic Americas and Europe, where you begin to, you, you, you're being told from crash, you are this, you are that, you are this, you are that. So what do you want to become when you grow up? I want to become that, I want to become that, I want to become that. And at the end of the day, what, what, who are you? It has become the biggest question. You know, who are you and, and, and where do you come from? So identity has become the striking question, which every young person out there, both young and old, we would want to find themselves, re-identify their ancestries, have the blood connections, know where they are coming from, understand their makeup and their genetic composition, so that by understanding their past, a chance they may begin to understand themselves mm -hmm. and know exactly them. because when you get to the hospital and the doctor asks you a question so do you have a history of diabetes in your family do you have a history of cancer in your family do you have a history of high blood pressure in your family the doctor is asking that question because he knows or she knows or they know in modern woke language because they know because even now doctors who went to school to study anatomy they no longer know whether they're male or female, but that's for another day. <laughs> so they, they've gone to school to study this thing, <laughs> but they, they now don't know it anymore. True, very yeah. true. You, 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 yeah. then, you then want to ask and say, what, what, what is it that 
that drives the societal fiber if identity is not the critical part of that? Is, is, is it good that you just photo? Rather, rather, let's go with Elon Musk and let's just produce robots. Because if we are going to remain as human beings, then identity and individuality must be upheld. This is what has brought us to where we are. It is the diverse, the diverse city of nationalities, language, cultures, and, and, and what we bring to the table. Of course, it has not been done in a good way because of greed and other human elements. But if we could just put aside our, our swords and weapons and convert them into plowsheds and we plant food and eat, there's enough land for everybody. There's enough food for everybody. There's enough oxygen for everybody. There's enough water for everybody. Who, who, who amongst us would put a, a fence around a well so that other people cannot drink of the water? Because he's the only one who must drink. Tenten begins to create this whole... So there's a big awakening on the continent because some of the... And because of a gain of movement. Some have gone to London and they've been told you're illegal immigrants. They went to Australia. They were told you are a foreigner. They went to America. They were told you are an alien and all these definitions. And so they ask, oh, so where is home? Then they come to Africa and they are told, no, you need a passport. You need a visa to go to a country next door. But my grandmother is across the river. No, you need a passport. So this whole political conversation comes into play that I cannot be a foreigner there and be an alien there and be an illegal immigrant there. And then I come back to Africa. I'm still a foreigner on my own land. So mm -hmm. you begin to see this awakening and the, the consciousness of unity, looking for each other, under the great umbrella of Ubuntu. So yes, there is an awakening. Okay, good. That was a very long, long explanation to get that, but I'm glad that it's a yes <laughs> from your side. Maybe I should, I, should, I should have just said yes. yes. <laughs> no, don't. I'm glad you didn't just say yes. <laughs> uh, Joshua, I want to ask you, what in your perception are the ancestors? You are an ancestor to your children and your fathers are ancestors to you in that what, what was in them is in you. So you and your ancestors are one and you and your children are one. So maybe for me again, this is the triune uh, combination of time mm. that the past tense has never left us. The future tense is never arriving. No one has ever seen tomorrow. Tomorrow is always tomorrow. Yesterday has never left and tomorrow is not coming. But today is continuous. So if, you, if we understand the concept of time, it will be easy for us then to move into the concept of life itself. That the, it, is the, 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 it is the tree, it is the fruit, and it is the seed inside the fruit. What is in the seed is in the fruit. It is in the tree. But the tree is not the fruit. The fruit is not the seed. But the three of them are one. Identity and individuality can be experienced. But yet these three elements are intertwined in one. So that by the time you plant a seed, mm -hmm. it will reproduce after its own kind. There's no way you can plant a banana tree and boom, comes up mango. It will always produce what is in it. So for me, ancestors is our DNA. And, and ancestors is our gene pool. Ancestors is our parents in us. So I always say, instead we make that confuse many people when I say they, 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 they lie in the ground, but they are buried in our bones and they're buried in our bloodlines. They're buried in our veins. So yes, the, the, the corpse is over there, but everything that was in them, the complexion of our face, the shapes of my teeth, uh, mm. even the shape of my hair, my height, the, the capacity to expand or to shrink, my metabolism rate, my intelligence, my what it is actually all transmitted. And on top of that, it is my their fears, which become my fears. It mm. is their intellect, it becomes my intellect. It is their, 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 their frustrations and their traumas, which become my traumas. Because how can it be that a one-year-old child can be afraid of a snake and they've never seen a snake except that they the trauma building them if drug addicts can produce drug addicted children what makes you think that normal parents cannot produce normal children mm. so for me it speaks to our connection to the human gene 
and continuity of life. Mm. Right. I do, Henry. I heard you talking uh, sometime about DNA and how everything that you have uh, that comes forth out of you, even your downloads, as you might call them, comes from your DNA because that is your history. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a beautiful library. And actually, in one of my morning encounters, uh, I, I bumped on a thought that uh, relayed a message saying, so what if your mind is a silver screen? What if your mind is a monitor, which can actually co collect information from your conscious and subconscious mind and play it in your mind and dreams becomes the state where only in a peaceful, quiet space can you access the, the, the drive which is past history, your present life, and your future anticipation. Because in the midst of a dream, you're not limited by time. You can go backwards, you can go forward, you can do present. So because dreams are not, are not when you close your eyes, you're in a space of nothingness. Mm -hmm. And there time is, in, and space is immaterial. And, and the material is immaterial. And in that state of quietness, then the human body is able to access itself, to, to read its own chords and go back inside its own traumas, its joys, its fears, its love, its hatred, and then play that back either as live episodes of what happened or as warnings of what to protect and et cetera, because there's a conscious side also, which has moral and ethical guidance and et cetera. So for me, it becomes a very exciting studying self becomes the most exciting business any human being can do. And if you can access that drive, goodbye to universities. You don't need to know anything outside. You need to know everything that is inside of you. Well, I think that that's something that you need to document and, and share with people. I mean, there's a lot about that, you know, hypnosis. And um, I just saw something today actually about the DNA because uh, Greg Braden, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, and he was talking about how they have found the Fibonacci sequence in DNA, you know, which is the golden, the golden, the, mean, the, the Fibonacci sequence, which is the golden ratio in the DNA. I'll send you. I've not, not read it yet. I've not read it yet. Yeah. Send I'll, me the I'll, link. I'll, I'll, it, it'll be exciting to read about it. Yeah. Mm. So, um, yeah. So they find these God codes in our DNA. You know, which is mm. things that in our indigenous people, Credo Mutwa, you know what I mean, have been talking about for for centuries. What what a what a privilege when I was in South Africa before he passed away, that actually I spent some some time in his in his presence when mm. I was writing the book Going Places in the Spirit, and uh, what an enlightenment to have sat at his feet and learn some of these informations first and i'll send you some of the pictures that we took together and uh, i'd love that uh, yeah i think that's a whole episode in itself you know yeah for another day for another oh, day for another day because I, I would love to ask you about your what you think of his idea of the cosmology you know he talks about the chitahuri and you know things like that i'd be interested to know what your thoughts are um we, on that we have we have the the, the language and if we have the language, it already goes without saying that we have experience with whatever it is that we are naming. So you cannot come to me and teach me about God when I have Mwari, Mkulunkulu, Velingwangi, Amata in my own indigenous space. It already means we have um, um, experienced this which we have named. Uh, and on the same note again, uh, I, I would move slightly from Mutwa and come back to him. In the same note, when you move into African art galleries in Europe and even on the greater space of Africa, you find all these beautiful masks and uh, scary masks of some of them look aliens mm. and designed in ways mm. and etc. The Egyptian pyramids and uh, chemistic writings of the hieroglyphics and uh, you find all these weird things and again these masks appear and these faces appear. So is it possible that the creation of African art, again I come back, it is a library. Our art is a library of where we're coming from. 
and these things that you see us now em emulating, we have preserved that knowledge, those encounters, and those experiences to become part of art. It's unfortunate that we go to Africa, we come to Africa for tourism, and we end up sleeping in five-star hotels, and we drive back and say, I've been to Africa. You have mm. not been to Africa <laughs> until you take off your shoes and experience the authenticity and the honesty of culture itself in its fullest. And then you can begin to say, I've been to Africa. To mm. that it, and then Baba Credo is talking about these Chitaulis and um, the aliens. He, he, sound, he sounded very spooky in the 80s and 90s mm. when he was saying that until Nas and other bodies and other discoveries are slowly beginning to come to light and agree with uh, these Chitaulis. And we don't have to doubt that the Hottentots, the short people, the Congo, and the Chitaulis, the Tikoloshis, and the smaller pe people, the aliens, and all these mm. things. Slowly, surely, we will get there. But you, it, it, take, it takes foolishness to want to learn by experience. Yep. Sometimes you know, it's as good when your mother tells you that the fire will burn you. You learn faster from knowledge of an experienced person uh, rather than for you to say, no, 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 mama, don't waste my time. I want to experience it myself. <laughs> my finger in there. You might come back with four fingers where you had five. So he, he is an untapped library. Another generation will come and prove him right. Yep, yep. And I'm sure all of all of these African cosmologies, I mean, even the, the Dogons in West Africa and Mali, you know, <clears throat> for saying for decades they talked about uh, that they come from this from Sirius. Okay, that's an Egyptian cosmology, uh, but they said no, not from that star. Sirius is the brightest star in the sky. They said no, not that one. There's one behind there. There's another planet. It's not that one. And it was only in the late 1800s that they discovered uh, that, that that Sirius is a binary star, and there's another. So we've got Sirius A, Sirius B. How did those Dogon tribe know about that for centuries without a telescope? <laughs> without a telescope. And without then you, you come back to Africa, you come back to African language, then to actually to be able to name these stars and name them one by one. That one is, that one is, that mm -hmm. one is. And then you connect that with tribes, connect that with plants mm -hmm. and etc. And the, 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 the naturalness of life, the, what is above is what is below. And I, and I think the world of academic academia has done itself a disfavor by discarding African knowledge system as they've lost a big, a big piece of the puzzle. In, in fact, they, they, they threw away the key into the vault <laughs> of, yes. of, because everything else they are still going to discover. They are going to discover. But whereas we have already discovered it, <laughs> But that revival is going on, Joshua. You know what I mean? And it's thanks to yeah. people people like you and others. There are plenty of people, but certainly you have a very big, loud, controversial voice out there. Um, so, Joshua, we're going to have to wrap this up for now. What I want to do is direct people. We didn't have time. We didn't talk about your books, but your music. You know, there's just so many topics. So where am I going? I'm going to put many links in this interview below, okay, so that people can be directed there. We might have to come back and we do one on books, do another interview on music, do another I'd love one that. on my craft and I fashion. Would love and it. Your, oh, yeah, your I'm dying to do the fashion. I'm a fashion yeah, designer by, by trade. So I'm dying oh, to have the fashion okay. one with you. <laughs> yeah. Then me and you have a project. I want us to design the... Zimbabwe traditional clothes. I've okay. already come up with a sample. Okay. I will share with you. Then we can see how we can influence the national dressing and we can come up with something mm. that represents this nation. But yes, I'm on Facebook, Farmers of Thought, Maponga. Uh, you will find me there. I have two, three, four accounts. Don't worry. I try to link them up because at one time I was being banned and chased away. And yeah. so I ended up opening a few other accounts keep alive and if I knew the rules I break a lot of rules <laughs> and I got myself in trouble then I have Instagram I think it's Maponga J I have Vudzijena J or Maponga J also on uh, Twitter uh, TikTok and uh, I have my blog page Farmers of Thought but my favorite spot is uh, Telegram there's a group there called Reading Club F-O-T okay. right. I build up a virtual library 
beautiful collection of my kind of books that I have read and I've gone through, but not finished all of them. There's more mm -hmm. than 3,000 books in that library. Wow. So wow. for those who might want to learn ancient Semitic knowledge systems, a variety of subjects mm -hmm. in African anthology, African anthropology, and mm -hmm. uh, a bit of agriculture here in old tales, uh, folklore stories. It's just a beautiful space, beautiful mm -hmm. space. And uh, FOT Reading Club, Farmers of Thought Reading Club, yeah. Okay, but I, I, will, I, I will put the links in there. And um, okay, so Joshua, thank you for that, giving us all that, knowledge, all that knowledge, all that wisdom, and and you will be back. I hope that you agree that you will be back. Oh, I made the offer. I made the thank offer you. that I will, thank be you. I, will, I will be there. <laughs> and for now, thank you. And thank you for your service to Africa and, and humanity, really. Thanks to you. Thanks to you for making this uh, platform possible. I nice. look forward to seeing you again. Maybe we can do a show once a month. Once a month going that. forward and let's yeah, see how it turns. I love how that. It turns out. Super. Lovely. So thank you, Joshua, and thank you to our viewers. And until the next time, bye.